Okay, so we're going to be going over um, some notes that you would have taken on this chapter if we were in class, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm just going to explain things. You guys have learned about the states of matter. There's actually four states of matter, but we typically talk most often about the three states. And that video that we um, will watch along with our lab will kind of help us talk about this in a couple of different ways. But um, we know that there are solids, liquids, and gases, right? They're physical forms that a substance can exist in. And we know that matter is made up of atoms and molecules. They're too small for us to see without really powerful microscopes. And we talked about this a little bit last year. So um, if we could see what the particles look like, this is one of my favorite pictures to explain that. So if it's a solid on the far left there, they, those particles, if we were able to see them, would not move fast enough to overcome the, the strong attractions that they have between them. So they are very close together and they vibrate in place. In the middle, those are particles of a liquid. So you can see that they're a little bit farther apart and they still um, are close, but not quite as close as a solid would be. So they move fast enough to overcome some of the attraction between them and they're still close together, but they can kind of slide past one another. And then on the far right, we talk about the particles of a gas, right? So those can almost completely overcome almost all of that attraction between them. So they're all over the place and they're far enough apart that they move independent of one another. So remember this picture when we're doing a bunch of things coming up here and as you think about that. The fourth state of matter, by the way, is plasma, which we'll talk a little bit about. So if you were to characterize or describe a solid, you would say it has a definite shape and a definite volume. So we take the length, width, and height for the volume. We learned that when we talked about density. And then obviously there is a shape to it. Now we have two types, which we're not going to spend a ton of time on. Um, when we talk about those particles being very close together and they don't move fast enough to overcome the attraction between them, we can look at what we call crystalline and amorphous solids. So on the left, that's a crystalline solid. Um, that would be something like quartz, right? Uh, which is sometimes uh, used in our homes for different things. And then on the right, that's an amorphous solid. That's glass. So it has all these particles that are not arranged in a certain pattern. So they're kind of what we call amorphous. So then we have to talk about liquids. How would we describe liquids if we were giving these sort of descriptive terms to it? So they don't have a definite volume. Remember, we can, uh, or excuse me, they do have a definite volume. We can take the volume of a liquid, and we did that in a graduated cylinder or a beaker, and we do that in milliliters or liters in the metric system. So they don't um, have a definite shape though. So they're gonna take the shape of their container. And that's important to note uh, a very big difference between solids and liquids, right? We could say they're similar because they have a definite volume. You take their volume differently, but they definitely have one. And then when it comes to their shape, this is where they differ, right? So liquids don't have a definite shape. The particles do move fast enough and they overcome some of that attraction between them. So they're farther apart, remember, if you think about the picture. So we should always mention surface tension when we talk about liquids. So you can see on the far right there, that is some dew right on grass in the morning, you get what's called surface tension. So this is a force that acts on a liquid and it minimizes the surface area and it does cause some liquids to form these spherical drops. Therefore, you've seen that before when we talk about dew. Now, we also have to mention this term viscosity. If something is really viscous, it's very thick and it doesn't flow very easily. So if I were in class right now, I would ask a bunch of you, give me an example of something that's really thick. It's still liquid, it still flows, but it, it, it flows slowly. So some of you might say syrup, or you might say oil that we would put in our car to um, go around all of the parts in the car and what we call lubricate them so that they don't rub together and cause engine problems or parts to um, be able to have too much friction and not let your car work the way it should. Honey is very viscous. So it's still a liquid. It still flows. It still fits the properties, but they have a little bit stronger of an attraction than a normal, let's say, water type liquid would. So um, it's a good term that we use to describe something that resists flow a little bit. So um, if it's very viscous, it resists flow. Then we have what are called gases, right? So you're familiar with gases. Now these guys are kind of mysterious in a way because they're gonna take up any amount of space that you give them. So think if I had some helium in a balloon and I let the balloon go in our classroom, that helium would go all over the place, right? It's a gas. Same thing when I let the air out of a you know regular balloon that doesn't have helium in it. It's gonna take the amount of space that you give it. So it's really hard to figure out its volume. It doesn't have a definite volume. 
it does not have a definite shape, right? It's going to take any space that we give it and break away completely. So we're going to address gases here in the next um, section and um, talk about some laws, Charles and Boyle's laws. But we'll pause on that for right now. Um, but there is a way that we obviously um, figure out the amount of gas kind of in a different way. And we'll talk about that soon. So join me back in class right now.